You already sang during the earlier service, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, now you're going to sing again? Yes. Okay, we're excited. Thank you. Shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them. Do not be afraid, I bring you good news. Boys and girls, you did so well. Thank you. Really excited and pumped and ready to go. Um, regardless of where we're coming from or why we're here, we're all here to see a little bit more of Jesus, to gather around him, to grow of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here. If you will stand with us. We're going to sing to our God. Um, we're going to sing the song, Angels We Have Heard on High. And the, the chorus of this song is not in English, so let me tell you what it is. So it says, glo o o o o o o o o o o o Put our hands together and sing this. Sing it out. Sing 
take a seat. We're going to sing a couple of more songs here in a moment, but we want to stop and pause and recognize that even as we just sang and proclaimed that we want all glory to go to God, we recognize as honest people that we often steal glory for ourselves. The Bible calls that sin. It says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we don't measure up to his glory and his justice and his righteousness and his love. Uh, and yet we try to take glory for ourselves. We magnify self while turning from God. And so we don't just pause and admit that before him. There may be specific sins. There might be specific wrongs in your mind that you need to confess to him and admit to him. He already knows about it, but it's good for us to be real and to talk about those things with him. So I'm going to give you some time for silent confession. And then after a a moment of silence, I'm going to pray a prayer of thanksgiving for his forgiveness. Let's pray. God, we admit to you what you already know. You see us. You know us. And so we confess and agree with you that we've drifted from your plan and your design for us. We've fallen short of your glory as we've sought to take glory for ourselves, as we've sought to be our own gods. Father, we thank you that you're a forgiving God. We thank you that you proved that through Jesus being born as a baby, taking on the human limitations of this world, and yet living the perfect life that none of us have lived. Thank you for living the perfect life in our place, for dying a sacrificial death on the cross, and for setting us free from sin, restoring us back to you. So God, help us to live in newness of life because you've forgiven us and freed us, and because you love us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Born 
to set thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee Israel strength and consolation hope of all the saints thou art dear desire of every nation joy of every longing heart let's stay together and sing this to deliver born a child and yet a king born to reign in us forever now thy gracious kingdom bring by thine own eternal spirit
Taught us. And truly he taught us to love His love, His love And His gospel is peace God, we ask for your peace in this season wars around us of our own making those who wage war against us we find ourselves in the midst of hurting and being hurt so we ask for your help we thank you that you alone can cause all wars to cease can make all things right because you see and you answer every wrong that is ever done you have the final say and through Jesus you give us mercy and help in our time of need and so we ask for that God we pray that you will help us to know you more by your word now help us to understand help us to be changed it's in Jesus name I pray amen y'all can take a seat thank you thanks guys for leading us uh, my name is Dave. Again, I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Before we spend some time in the scriptures, I wanted to, sorry, I got to chew up the mint in my mouth. <laughs> I just realized you can't talk when you've got a mint in your mouth. Okay, now I'm ready. I want to introduce one of our global partners who actually grew up at this church, right? Like Natalie Arocco is a founding member and product of Grace Bible Church, and we are so proud of her. Give her a hand. We're glad to have her here. She's not just been a blessing to our church, kind of coming up and serving in our church over the years, but also to my family. Um, they live around the block, and she's been like a big sister to my daughter, so really glad to have her uh, in our corner as well over the years, so thank you for that. But Natalie's going to have a luncheon after the service in the back building. We want to invite all of you to go and join that luncheon. There will be food there at the luncheon. But more importantly, you'll get to know Natalie. You'll get to hear about what she's doing with our sister church in Guatemala. So we've been going to Guatemala for years. She's been going to Guatemala. Now she lives there. Now Guatemala is her home, really, right? And so just to kind of, kind of, not so much, maybe. Yeah, you have two homes, two homes. That makes sense, that's good. And so I just want to kind of tease you a little bit with what you can hear more about, but Natalie, share with us why we would want to get more involved in your ministry in Guatemala. Yeah, thank you, Dave. First of all, I just want to say hello to everyone. Uh, if you haven't met me, I know many of you might be new to Grace Bible Church. Feel free to come and say hi. I love to meet all the new faces uh, here at Grace. And uh, yes, I think it is important to get involved with the ministry in Guatemala because I believe that us, especially those who have been saved by the hope and love of Jesus Christ, have this drive or this, this desire to change the world or to make an impact. And sometimes, most of the time, we do that in our own community, and I hope and pray you're doing so in Colleen and wherever you live. But it's also important to look beyond your Judea and your Samaria to look to the ends of the earth. And Guatemala is a place that might be very different. And there's people who speak a different language and live in a different culture and uh, have different desires maybe. But we all have the same need, and that is to experience the joy and peace that Christ gives. And so if you have a desire to be a light in a dark place, then come to my luncheon and hear more about what God is doing in Guatemala and how you can get more involved. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to have you. Appreciate it. Let me pray. Uh, I'm going to pray just a blessing over Natalie and our sister church in Guatemala. God, we thank you that we have the great privilege of being involved not only in what you're doing here in Colleen, Texas, but Lord, we're involved uh, through your people, with your work, all over the world. And Natalie represents that for us in Guatemala, a little part of our family there. We pray your encouragement for her. We pray that this luncheon would be a great time for folks to get to know her ministry better, to get to know her better. Lord, I pray for more prayer supporters, financial resources, and encouragement. Lord, we 
pray for those that would go to Guatemala in future trips, that you would uh, strengthen them and equip them for it. We pray for our sister churches down there, that you would strengthen them, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, that they would be a light for you in that place. And God, we thank you. We thank you for our brothers and sisters, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now I have the pleasure of introducing a guest speaker. We devote time every week to studying the scripture, so if you have a Bible, go ahead and grab that Bible, open it up to Isaiah chapter 9. We that Terrence is his favorite pastor on staff there at downtown church. Just don't let him hear the recording. Yeah, okay. Don't let the other don't pastors hear this. Um, but Terrence has been doing youth ministry there. He's done college ministry over the years at different places. He's now the church planter in residence at that church, about to plant a church in the neighboring city of Bartlett, which is kind of like next town over slash suburb of Memphis. Uh, and so if you want to hear more about that church plant too, I'm sure you could tell folks about Absolutely. that as well. And his dear wife, Ashley, who is actually a Texan. So we're glad to have them in our neighborhood. So we're glad to have you guys with us. Thank you so much for being willing to share with us and come on. Thanks. Awesome. Thank y'all. Thank y'all so much for having me. Yeah. Texas is home too for me in a way. And so We've been hanging out here this week with family and celebrating Christmas here. We went to Magnolia Silos yesterday, the whole Chip and Joanna thing. And my wife was in Disney World with that yesterday. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea. The land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the night of the tramping warrior in battle tumult. And every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us, a child for our king in prayer. Father God, we come to you in your mighty son's Jesus name. Uh, Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Father God, I pray that you would move me out of the way. I pray that I would decrease so that you can increase and be made much. New York Times best-selling book, The Greatest Generation. Uh, Tom Brokaw gives great detail about the lives of World War II veterans. He, he calls the World War II generation the greatest generation. And he does memoirs and, and shares about these guys' lives and gives you life uh, where uh, they, they could have been focusing on other things. They focused on this uh, great challenge, and they, and they stepped into this. And so one particular story caught my attention. It was about uh, this, this man, uh, Thomas Brederick. And Thomas Brederick's story was, was very uh, interesting to me. Five days, because they didn't want to devastate him. Later, he would find out uh, that he was blinded from that shot. Now, um, if he would have been upset for the rest of his life and never wanted to uh, uh, do anything challenging or hard again, man, who could blame him? I, I could totally get that. Uh, if he uh, you know, never wanted to step into any more, he was gravely wounded. But once he got over the initial understandable anger, he set out to be the best husband, father, businessman, and citizen he could be, sight or no sight. He didn't grow bitter and dependent on others. He didn't blame the world for his condition, unquote. Hear this. 23-year-old man, right, uh, at this point in his life when he got back home, he was 23 years old. And, uh, and he's trying to engage back in life again. So he's trying to learn. He even gets back on the dating scene, and he literally goes on a blind date. No pun <laughs> intended there. <laughs> That's what Brokaw says. He, went, he goes on a blind date uh, with this young woman by the name of Eileen. Eileen would eventually become his wife, and they would be married for 54 years. And so married for 54 years, had uh, seven children. But she says she was so drawn to Thomas because of his enthusiasm and his joy by day, teaching himself braille by night. And so he eventually started his own business. Not too bad for what he was going through. Had seven children, as we mentioned. He said he tried to make as many of those sporting events as he could. So he's, he's there at the sporting events, being present. He's sticking to his word with that he was going to try to be the best husband, father, businessman. He could be sight or no story to even say, just, yeah, go, go be just like Broderick. Get over whatever you're going through this morning. That's why I'm not bringing, it up, bringing, that, I'm not bringing it up for that reason. You may very well be experiencing some very real pain this morning, so I don't bring it up for that. I don't bring it up to say, go be tough. Go pull yourself up by your bootstraps be like Broderick. I don't bring it up in different ways. And because we have a spiritual enemy, it will probably be targeted at you in a way that hurts you just right. 
because that's, that's the fallen world that we live in. Maybe it's the darkness and isolation of feeling alone. Maybe it's the darkness associated with a great loss. This is the time of year where we begin to take inventory. Start at college, right? Uh, you're taking on a new challenge, and it's terrifying for you. Depression, anxiety, sickness, financial strain, abuse from the past or maybe even the present, raising kids, all of that can just be uh, heavy for you in this season. And these things can creep in, and they can create this dark cloud over your head, and it can feel like it's only raining in your world. So you're on, you're on social media and Facebook, and everybody's living this perfect life, and you're looking at that social media timeline, and everybody's get another week or another year. It might make a difference on whether or not you're going to quit that thing that you started or not. All right? It may save your life, because we live in a world where it gets dark enough where you don't, you know, some of us don't want to go on any longer. So, and this is the big idea. The big idea is this. There are a few things that will impact your future and your legacy more than your response to darkness and adversity. There are a few things that will impact your future and your legacy more than your response to darkness and adversity. Who you are and who you're becoming is largely impacted by how you respond to the darkness because the darkness will come. In the case of Tomix Brederick's story, it showed up. That could have been a totally different story if he didn't respond to darkness and adversity uh, the way that he did. And I know that when it hurts, it can really hurt. And when it's dark, darkness can get really dark. So I don't want to minimize any challenges that you may be going through or experiencing in your life. But I want you to know that those things are not too big for God. Those things are not too big with God. Many uh, thought leaders have wrestled with this contrast of darkness and light. I just wanted to look at a couple. Martin Luther King Jr. says, but I know somehow that only when it's dark enough can you see the stars. Og Mandino said, I will love the light for it shows me the way, yet I will endure the darkness because it shows me the stars. Anybody ever been there? Faith is seeing light with your heart when all your eyes see is darkness. Brene Brown says, the dark does not destroy the light. It defines it. So how will you respond to darkness? How are you responding to darkness? Are you responding to it alone? Are you working through it you know, with somebody else? We feel the pressure to put on the perfect face and to put on the church face. And everything is good and everything is great. And we actually know uh, the marriage is holding on by a thread. Or last night I thought about ending it all. Or I'm in this season and I don't know what to do. I'm just confused. Or I started a new job and I feel completely incompetent and I, and I feel like quitting. Those are the real places that we find ourselves. And so if you are in that place, I want to encourage you, you're, you're in the, the right place. But the reality is there are a few things that will impact your future and your legacy, like how you respond to darkness and adversity. As we come to our text, Isaiah chapter 9, we will see the contrast between light and darkness on display in the life of Israel. These are God's covenant people. Uh, and God, Yahweh God, the God who saves, is using the backdrop of a dark and fallen world and a wicked people. He's using all of that ugliness and all of that darkness as a backdrop to introduce a great light into the world. Isaiah, the prophet, he has a word for King Ahaz. He has a word for King Ahaz. He has a prophetic word for King Ahaz. He has a prophecy for him. And the prophecy goes like this. It says, uh, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. There we go. The Lord yourself, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, out of context, that makes for a great coffee mug verse, great Christmas ornament verse, nice little uh, Christian tattoo, if you will, 
right? We can throw that around rather lightly this time of year. But in its original context, this was a matter of life and death. This was a matter of great hope from a people who were in a dark place who needed great hope. See, King Ahaz had gotten himself and the people of Israel in a lot of trouble. He had gotten himself in trouble. He had gotten the whole kingdom uh, in a lot of trouble. Uh, And we have to do a little jog through that history to get this a little bit more. At this point in Israel's history, Israel, uh, which was one nation at one point, had now divided into two nations. You had the northern kingdom and you had the southern kingdom, and they didn't really get along. Think of like a Texas OU rivalry, but it's a lot bigger than that. But that type of thing, they really don't like each other. And Ahaz was in the southern kingdom. Uh, The northern kingdom had formed an alliance with another nation, and they had a list of demands for the southern kingdom, and a list of demands went like this. Either, southern kingdom, you get with us, you join us and form an alliance with us to help us fight against our enemies, or we're going to wipe you off the map. Simple as that, plain and clear. Either going to join us and help us fight against our common enemies, or little southern kingdom, we're going to wipe you off the map. So King Ahaz, the king of the southern kingdom, is hearing this, and he's checking his reserves and looking at what he has, and he's like, yeah, we actually don't have the power to beat these guys, so what are we going to do? Are we going to join with them, or are we just going to give up and get annihilated? What are we going to do? God speaks into his situation with this verse. He says, no, 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 I am with you. God is with you. Like, I don't know about that. He, he, he says, I don't know about that. And Ahaz gets clever. He says, instead of uh, getting with those guys and and making an alliance with them or trusting God, I'm not going to do either. What I'm going to do is I'm going to form an alliance with Assyria, the the, the biggest, most powerful nation uh, in the world at that time. I'm uh, 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 going to find myself in an allegiance with them, and I'm going to pay them off and do whatever I have to do to make sure that they protect me. And that's what he does. And he basically uh, forms a bond with Assyria, and he begins to worship pagan gods. He brings an altar and sets it up in God's temple and worships these pagan gods. Uh, He pays tribute. He takes things, devoted things that were in God's temple, and he begins to give those things to Assyria. And before you know it, he turns uh, Judah into this idol worshiping place. There were idols everywhere. He had completely neglected uh, God's word. He completely turned his back on God. He, he had a self-salvation strategy. He tried to fix it himself. He tried to do his own thing, and he ends up paying for it. He and all of Israel ended up paying for it. He chose to trust man instead of trusting God. And so he trusted Assyria. He, he builds this alliance with Assyria. And he thinks Assyria has his back, but this is what happens. Assyria gets greedy. So they take down the northern kingdom, but what do they do? They keep going, and they keep going south. And before you know it, all of Israel, north and south, is captive now because this person didn't trust God. He trusted in himself, and they found themselves in a very dark place. But God, but God, God intervenes. At this point, you can understand why God may have just left them to their own devices and left them to, to themselves. But that's not what happened. God keeps going. God keeps pursuing. And in spite of their failure, in spite of their weakness, he still has a plan to redeem them and save them. And that's exactly what he does. But I just want to encourage us. I know that Ahaz messed it up. And I know that Israel's in this bad place. But you and I, we cannot look down our nose at Israel. We can't even look down our nose at King Ahaz. We don't look down our nose at Israel. We look in the mirror at Israel. And we see our own shortcomings and our own tendencies uh, to form our own self-salvation strategies and to save ourselves. Which brings us to our first point. Because of our sin, we all need to be rescued from darkness. Because of our sin, we all need to be rescued from darkness. Verse 1 says, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. It's so good that that verse starts with but. Now, this place is in trouble, right? They're oppressed by Assyria. They're having to pay a bunch of money and tribute to this nation. They're getting abused, but, looking to the future, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. But, 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 God's salvation strategy is to engage this dark place still. He still loves these people. 
He's still faithful to these people. Even though they've broken the covenant, he's consistent to keep coming after them, even though they failed him still. And that's how God's salvation works. God is the God who saves. And some of us have been saved for so long that we forget that when God saved us, we were spiritually dead. We had nothing to offer. We had nothing to contribute to our salvation except for the sin and the darkness that God had to clean up. We had nothing to give. We had nothing to offer. We weren't drowning. We were at the bottom of the ocean dead. And he saved us and he engaged that darkness. So that that should encourage you if you don't know Christ this morning. Because your your, your darkness, it doesn't intimidate God. What you're going through doesn't intimidate God. What you did last night doesn't intimidate God. It doesn't scare God. It's not going to make him run away from you and say, "Uh, God is not like people. He steps right into the darkness. That's what this whole season is about. It's about the fact that the king of the world stepped on the stage of our lives in the middle of all of this brokenness in the world, all of the brokenness inside of us, and said, I'm not running away from it. I'm not scared of it. I'm not too good for it. Even though I am good, I'm going to step right into it, and I'm going to engage the darkness right on. And we see this uh, furthermore in verse 1. It says, in the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Hear this now. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. So let's break this down a little bit more. Isaiah is speaking in what we call the prophetic present tense, meaning as he's talking to Israel right now, he's talking to them about things that haven't happened yet as if they have already happened. So you may be in darkness now, Israel, but I'm looking forward to the future and I can see that the light has shone in the darkness and the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. He's talking about it as if it's already happened. It's like we're supposed to get barbecued this afternoon. And it's like if I said, man, the ribs are so good and they have filled my belly if I, as if I was already there. <laughs> That's how Isaiah is talking to this group of people. And so what are you talking about? Uh, Isaiah talking about uh, the light has shone to Galilee of the nations. The land of Galilee that Isaiah is describing is the first place that experienced this attack when Israel was attacked. It was the first place that experienced the darkness. But it will also be the first place, if you look forward to your New Testament, it will be the first place where Jesus begins to minister. So Isaiah saying, the first place that experienced this darkness and the suffering and pain, it will be the very first place that will experience this great light. God is not afraid to go straight into the darkness. There's no neighborhood that's too bad. There's no family that's too bad. There's no anything that's too dark or too corrupt for him to engage. Uh, God steps right into it. We see it in Matthew chapter 4, 23 through 24. And this is God uh, in Galilee, this place that Isaiah is talking about that had once experienced great darkness, but is now experiencing great light. Matthew chapter 4 says, And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, a healing, so healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, as those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. Jesus stepped right into the darkness. Jesus is that great light that steps right into our darkness. I think that intuitively... All of us know that we're broken. I think intuitively we all know that. Uh, I think we all know that we wrestle with darkness. But the question that I want to pose to you this morning, Grace Church, I want to pose this question. Do you feel comfortable stepping into the light? Do you feel comfortable stepping into the light? Because the light can be scary. The light can expose you. You can hide in the darkness. Nobody knows what's really going on with you if you're not in the light. Nobody knows about that addiction. Nobody knows what's really going on at home. Nobody really knows about the fear. So it can be very scary to step into the light because you feel like you might get judged. People might look down on you if you step into the light. People might compare themselves to you if you step into the light. But I just want to encourage you that you can step into the light. And this actually is a safe place. 
Like God wants to, wants to know you. And guess what? He already knows you. He just wants you to be honest enough to step into the light and be real with yourself and be real with others. He already knows about the brokenness. He already knows about the weakness. Our biggest fear, and especially for us as men, our biggest fear is to be exposed. But God says that it's a safe place to step into the light and, 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 and allow me to heal you. You can't fix yourself. You can't save yourself. And this, even this church is set up with groups for you guys to get to know each other on a deeper level. So God is saying it's a safe place to step into the light. And because of our sin, we all need to be rescued from darkness. Welcome to the club. You are not alone. As lonely and isolating as sin may uh, cause us to feel, it's not the truth. Uh, You can step into the light, which leads us to our next point. Because of the darkness in our fallen world, our hearts long for a king that will promote peace, justice, and righteousness. Because of the darkness in our fallen world, our hearts long for a just king that will promote peace, justice, and righteousness. Jesus isn't a Democrat or a Republican. He's not a Democrat or a Republican. He didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. Paul Heber, the missiologist, says it this way. He says, it must be noted that Christianity, if it is not hopefully denatured, never becomes fully at home in any culture. Always, when it is true to its genius, it creates attention. When it is true to its genius, it creates attention. Jesus and all of who he is cannot fit perfectly inside of any political box, whether it be an American political box or it be uh, Middle Eastern or Asian or African. It is is impossible for him and all of who he is to fit inside of man-made boxes. And I think that all of us get that intellectually. I think we get it up here. But at our heart, we still long for the perfect and just king. We long for a perfect kingdom that's led by a perfect king, because that's what we were created for. You and I were created to be led and loved by King Jesus, and we were created uh, to live under his rule. We were created to be known by him and to be guided by him and for him to be our Lord. And so in our hearts, we, we, we long for that. Creation groans for that. And sometimes we reach and grab for shadows uh, in this world. But God is saying that the only true king is King Jesus. And until he gets here, we, we will always be, always be dissatisfied with what we see in individuals. We will always be disappointed by it. Or even we will be judgmental of others who don't align with what we think or what we believe. But he didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. And because of the darkness in our fallen world, our hearts long for a just king who will promote peace, justice, and righteousness. We have to look no further than King Ahaz in the the story that we read earlier. He failed the people. And we can look at great kings like King David. He was good, but he still was only a shadow of things to come. He was not the one true king. Uh, at, birth, at best, our earthly leaders are like, uh, they're like the off-brand Dr. Pepper, not the real Dr. Pepper, all right? At best. And we all know the off-brand Dr. Pepper has the weird names, like Dr. Polk and Dr. Paul and Dr. Pib and all that stuff. And it's kind of flat and it don't taste right and don't really got any sugar in it at all. And it leaves you longing for the real Dr. Pepper. And Isaiah tells us about the real thing. He says, you've seen shadows of it. You've seen some poor examples of it, but there's one coming who will satisfy your thirst and will satisfy your heart forever, the real King Jesus, no flaws. His name is is a wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor, meaning that uh, he will be a wonder-working king meaning that he will be a counselor, meaning that he will have wisdom. We will one day have a king who has perfect wisdom and perfect power, a wonder-working king, a wonderful counselor. He's mighty God, meaning that he will not just be a man. He won't just be a man. Jesus was not just a man. Jesus was 100% God and 100% man all at the same time. 
That's what we have to look forward to. And that's what we have now as we, as we surrender our hearts to King Jesus. He is mighty God. He's the everlasting father, meaning that his reign will never end. Uh, and he will care for his subjects forever. That's the type of love that you were created for. Not the type of love that will run away when it's displeased with you. Not the type of love give, that will give up on you once it sees your ugly side, the real side. You were created for that type of everlasting father that sees you, knows you, and loves you right there for what you really are and for who you really are, an everlasting father, an everlasting love that will never end. That's who our King Jesus is. He is the Prince of Peace, meaning that he's the one that will come and cause all of the storms to stop. The storms that go on inside of your heart that keep you up at night, the reason why you can't sleep, he'll cause all of that to cease. He'll cause all of the anxiety to stop. You'll never have to take another Xanax again, never have to take another shot of whiskey again, never have to take another pill or smoke anything or drink anything again because he's the prince of peace that will cause all of the violence in your heart to cease. And he will cause all of the external storms and wars that go on in our world to cease. He'll cause all of the bombs to stop flying because the bombs won't need to fly anymore. Once the Prince of Peace steps on the scene, that's our King Jesus. And there's no man, no woman that can fill his shoes. That's what we were created for. We were created for this type of love, for this type of rulership, for this type of God. And you will not be satisfied until you have him. There will be a perpetual disappointment in man until you come face to face with the King of Kings. Uh, uh, St. Augustine says, our hearts are restless. Until we find rest in thee. Our hearts are going to be restless until we find rest in King Jesus. For my 31st birthday, last spring, my wife got me tickets to a symphony. Now, I don't usually do symphonies because I'm not bougie like that. But (laughs) I'm not saying that you bougie. If you like symphonies, that's cool. But my wife got me tickets to a symphony. And it's because uh, we were, we were planting a church, and we were planning on calling our church Symphony Church, but we ended up going up, going with another name. Uh, but it's cool. Got a cool illustration out of it, I think. So, uh, um, but anyways, we, we, were in, we named it Covenant Family Church. That's going to be the name of the church plant. But she took me to a symphony so that we can uh, actually see what a real symphony looks like. And so we got there a little early, and I was able to actually see the people tune up. And so... Uh, you, you hear the violinist over there doing his thing, and he's tuning up. Um, and, y'all, it just sounds like noise when you first get there. It don't sound like music yet. It's just noise. So the violinist is tuning up, doing his thing. And the cello is doing her thing, and the bass is over there. And the French horn, it just sounds like... Right? There's no music yet. It's just noise. But then... Here comes the moment we've all been waiting for. The conductor steps onto the stage. All of the chaos ceases. All eyes are on the conductor. What was once just noise is now sweet music. What was once just chaos is now peace. The job of the conductor is to unify a bunch of individual performers and to make them a unit that is able to do something that is bigger than themselves. That is what King Jesus does. He tells us to focus on him, and in doing so, we will find peace. The job of this, of this conductor is to unify the people, and that's what Jesus does. Jesus is the conductor of his church. And when we focus on him, we go from being a bunch of individuals to a unified body that is able to change the world. He turns our chaos into peace. When we get our eyes off of everything else, when we get our eyes off of ourselves and our own individual goals and agendas and focus our eyes on King Jesus as his church, we're able to light the world up and do some amazing things. Which leads us to our final point. God has left his church in the world to promote, to promote peace and be a light in a dark world. God has left his church in the world to promote peace and to be a light in a dark world. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, I'll read it for us. This is Jesus speaking to his people. He says, 
You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. No, do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and give, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Grace Bible Church, Colleen needs you to be the light. He needs you to be the light. Jesus Christ could have came right down here, bought a house in Colleen, and did ministry in Colleen, served the least of these in Colleen. Probably been great, probably would start a little house church or something, probably would have killed it, right? But that, that wasn't his strategy. His strategy was to leave you here in the world and to be a light in the world. And somebody needs you to be a light. Somebody needs you to be a light. He could have done it a ton of other ways. He decided to go with us. So I guess we all we got, so we got to figure it out. (laughs) All right? And so somebody needs you to be a light. Maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's... Maybe it's a classmate, a teammate, a coworker, a neighbor. Maybe it's an in-law, and I know that can be rough, right? But somebody uh, needs you to be a light individually. And then collectively, Colleen needs Grace Bible Church to be a light. Because you get all those little lights working together, you got a much bigger light that can make a much bigger impact in this place. Then you got other churches, because it's not just all about Grace Bible Church. You got even a bigger light in the world, and that's God's rescue mission to the world. That's God's plan. He wants to use you. He said, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So you guys got global partners that are doing great things in other places. You guys are here, and you are the light, a a city on a hill that can't be hidden. And sometimes you you can look behind yourself. You're like, you talking to me? Yes, talking to you. (laughs) you. You're the one. You're here for a reason. And and that's why we're planting the church in Memphis. We believe that God still wants to push back more darkness in Memphis. And like I said, he could, could, you know, come down here himself and do that, but he's chosen to work through people. And so as as weak and feeble as we are, we we trust that by his strength, God will use some people to continue to reach more people. And that's his plan. That's what he he wants to do. He, He wants to reach the world through you. Because he's the light of the world, and he, he wants to light you up to be the light of the world right along with him. Some 2,000 years ago, the light entered the world. His name was Jesus Christ. And he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for the sins of the world. But darkness could not hold him down. So he got up some three days later. And he asked you to follow him. Follow him. Step into the light. It's so easy to, to, to stand back in the darkness. It's safe back there, or it feels safe. Nobody has to know you. Nobody has to know the real you. you. You can put on. But Jesus says, step into the light and follow him. You can trust him. You don't want to have to take on this world by yourself. You don't want to have to take on the anxiety that's going on inside of you by yourself. And guess what? You can't, but he can. And he longs to love you and show his strength and his power on your behalf. Why would you turn down? Why would you turn down, rather, such a great gift? Why would you turn him down? Why would you turn down that love? We can't do this on our own, but with him all things are possible. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you in your mighty son's Jesus' name. Thank you for today. Um, God, I pray that you would Soften our hearts and open up our eyes and show us your glory so that we can, we can chase after you, Father God, and stop chasing after uh, the idols of this world. Forgive us when we're like King Ahaz, God, when we seek our own plan and our own strategy, when we try to save ourselves and save others, Father God, but you already have a plan. Help us to follow you. God, give us courage to step into the light. Give us courage to be in community with other brothers and sisters in Christ who can know us, who can encourage us. Father, God, I pray that nobody here tries to uh, wrestle with this life alone. God, I pray uh, as we long for your coming, Father God, just, uh, just give us wisdom. 
God. Give us wisdom, wonderful counselor. Uh, Show us how to look more like you. It's in your mighty sons. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. That was fantastic. Appreciate the encouragement. We now have a chance to respond in faith uh, to what was just preached to us. We were challenged to trust in Jesus as our only hope. And so communion is a way for 2,000 years that Christians have expressed that. We walk that out uh, by taking the bread and taking the cup. We're, we're saying with our bodies that we believe that we need, desperately need Jesus. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, we encourage you to take part with us today, no matter what church background you come from, as a testimony of your faith in him, as a remembrance of what he's done for you by dying on the cross for your sins and rising from the dead. If you're not a follower of Jesus, we would encourage you to make this a time of spiritual reflection, uh, to come forward with everyone else that comes to the tables, but to pass by the bread and cup and take a chance, take a moment to just ask yourself, what is it that you are trusting in if you're not trusting in Jesus? And I'd love to talk to you more about what that means to trust in him. We're told that Jesus had a last supper with his disciples, that in the middle of the Passover meal, he made it about himself. He took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper, he lifted a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then later the apostle Paul says that when churches take the bread and cup and make it about Jesus instead of about ourselves and our factions and our divisions, then we are truly proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns. Amen. You can stand and we'll exit the left side of your chair sections and rotate around clockwise to the tables up front.
Praise God. Amen. You guys can take a seat for just a second. Amen. Just a few quick announcements. Uh, number one, you'll see under your chair, let me click that forward, you'll see a blue card that says connect. If you're new and you've not filled this out, please grab this and fill it out for us. This gives us a way concretely to make sure we don't miss you. We want to connect you to life here. You can fill it out and then turn it into the desk out front. You'll see someone up there with a name tag on, and they will give you a free Grace Bible Church mug. So you want to make sure you do that. Yes. That's pretty exciting. Um, also, I uh, want to just orient you towards beyond the Connect cart, how we do life together at Grace Bible Church. We're, we're called to find purpose together in Christ, and we try to break that down into three simple stages. Number one, we just did this. We gather and worship together. We're, we're remaking our identity, gathering around Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us. Number two, we serve on a team. So if you're not serving on a team already, we want to invite you into helping us be the light of the world in Colleen, Texas. Joining one of our teams, you can contact the office or email office at begrace.org, and we can get you on one of our Sunday morning teams to help us to do what we do here in Colleen. And then third, join a group. Um, Terrence talked about this. Sharing vulnerability, sharing life with others is really important. There are many different groups. Again, you can contact the church office, or you can start by looking up at the different uh, group leaders whose faces are on the wall right out here in this foyer. Um, but we encourage you to take these next steps of discipleship. Um, also, we have some of our global outreach partners who are coming in town in just a couple of days, I think tomorrow even, um, but they've had to leave the field. They're transitioning their work, and they're going to be here for a little while. Um, they were in a dangerous place. I'm not even going to say where they were, but anyway, Vanderwerfs are coming back, and we want to bless them while they're here. Um, so they're going to be transitioning their ministry, do some linguistics ministry, Bible translation type stuff. Um, and so they're going to be here locally. We want to bring them stuff for their house just so they can do life, right? Like imagine you're setting up a brand new house and you have nothing, okay? So that's where they're starting. So the next two weeks, December 29th and January 5th, we'll have a table with some volunteers that are accepting gifts. You can bring, you know, canned goods, stuff like that. Also, there's an Amazon list. If you go to our website, begrace.org slash housewarming. You can find more information about that, or you could drop gift cards off as well. But help us. We'll be doing that the next two Sundays. And we want to bless Stephen and Angela Vanderwerf. All right, prayer is available after the service. If you'd like to talk more with someone about what it means to trust in Jesus, or you just are going through something hard and want someone to pray for you, there'll be some folks available to pray for you right under this screen on this side of the stage. Um, before you leave, too, I want to uh, kind of announce a couple of this year stuff that's happening couple days, we have our Christmas Eve services. So I think we have a few of these invite cards left. Our Christmas Eve services will be 4 p.m. and 5.30 p.m. So as always, we just ask that you perfectly divide yourselves among the two services, okay? So we'll have children's story time. We'll have candles. We'll have some Christmas songs, cocoa, cookies, short message. And uh, this is a great opportunity to invite your neighbors or your friends to something at church that they might be more open to coming to. So we encourage you to invite them to that Christmas Eve service. And then also we have a Bible reading plan for 2020. If you're wanting to start a new plan, we've got some basic information in here about how to read the Bible and then a plan that'll get you through about 80% of the Bible in a year, mostly chronological order, but kind of breaking up Old and New Testament together. So those plans are off in the hallway as well. Bible reading plan 2020. I think that's all of it. Did I remember everything? Okay. Well, remember, we all long for that perfect king, and we celebrate at Christmas time the birth of Jesus, the king who truly brings peace. God bless you. You may be dismissed. And I think also I will say, is it okay if people want to talk to you more about your church plant, Covenant Family Church? All right. They'll hang around here for a few minutes if you want.